Do you feel that in a time when we are more connected than ever, we are drifting away from real human connections, especially to ourselves? I do. Hi, I'm Leticia Latino, and I want to invite you to join me and my very inspiring guests in exploring ways to reconnect to your essence, to your definite purpose, to what makes you tick. Are you ready? Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of Back to Basics, Reconnecting to the Essence of You. I'm honored today to have Dr. Patricia Fogarty Mack with me. She champions patient safety and quality improvement at Will Cornell Medicine. Hello, Dr. Mack, or Patricia, rather. Can I call you Patricia? Absolutely. <laughs> Hi, nice to he- have you at Back to Basics. Oh, thank you. I'm so pleased to be here with you. Well, I'm, I'm super excited because uh, actually we got connected through one of my favorite episodes so far of Back to Basics, uh, Dr. Ruth Gautian, and she was marvelous. And uh, she has been, you know, uh, recommending to talk to people like you that are, I'm sure, so inspirational. Oh, thank That's very kind. And then, of course, you know, in, 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 we're still in pandemic time. So obviously anybody that is in the in the medicine field, health field and, and, and something like you are doing, like improving patients uh, quality, you know, and their experience, that's something I'm very curious and looking forward to talking to you about. Well, it's much appreciated. It's been it's been a long year, but I think we're actually turning the corner now and doing things even better than we have been. That's that's great to hear. So, you know, obviously I do a little research on all my guests and and I mean, you you have a, an, an amazing career and uh, one that, you know, if I understand correctly, you went to school in New York, right? I went to medical school in New York, yeah. To medical school. And it's the uh, same, say you stayed where you went to school, right? Yes. I did a little bit of training at uh, two other places, but basically I've been here for 35 years. And I love that. And, and I'm not jumping ahead because I'm going to start about uh, asking you about your childhood and, you know, things you were passionate about. Did you, did you know you wanted to be a doctor as a little girl? Tell me a little bit about your early years. I, I did, actually. I don't really recall when I started to want to be a doctor. Sometime in grammar school. Um, I'm an only child, mm-hmm. and my parents were older. And I think that they just sort of treated me a little bit like a small adult, even when I was a child. You know, I, I recall always going to the library with my dad every Saturday morning. And, you know, I was very much into reading and learning about things. And I recall reading some books about uh, things in the early 1900s in New York, like typhoid and, and, and the public health measures taken to, to cure that. And I just found that really interesting and fascinating. Wow. And were you born in New York? Yes, I was. Oh, there you go. You continue my streak. <laughs> I'm joking in my episodes that, uh, you know, a, a good chunk of my guests recently have been all from New York. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And so about growing up in New York City sounds also very exciting. Well, I actually um, spent uh, the first 13 years of my life in the Bronx. Okay. In in a community um, that used to be the world's largest uh, apartment complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were there because my uncle was a priest. And uh, so the extended family of, you know, my, well, my parents and my grandparents actually moved to this area Um, from Manhattan originally. And so even though I was an only child, I had many, many cousins around me and we all went to the same grammar school and it was just a lot of fun. It was a very supportive community. Used to walk to school, you know, go out to lunch at a local restaurant from school. It was really very nice. Um, Unfortunately, the neighborhood did change and crime became a problem. And my dad was a retired uh, uh, New York City police officer Mm-hmm. And so we moved to the suburbs and I went to high school in the suburbs. Wow. And, uh, you know, I was sad to leave the Bronx. It was just great to be so close to extended family. And it was very easy. You know, it, we, I lived in an apartment, but you walked everywhere and it had a playground down the street. And it was just very easy. Um, and, you know, my high school uh, was fantastic. I lived in Ridgewood, New Jersey. It was a great school system. 
And from there, I went to college and medical school. But my childhood was wonderful. I have no complaints. Wow. And and I, I think I read somewhere that you were the first person in your extended family that uh, to attend medical school. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. I think um, I'm still the only person. Wow. <laughs> wow. So everybody's calling you. I don't know. <laughs> Everybody calls. It's actually, it, you know, I'm so happy to be able to refer them places and answer questions. <laughs> and it's just great. I, I, I'm anxious You know, none of my children seem to want to do medicine and I'm anxious about who's going to take care of me. <laughs> retired I, older, I know, you know, you, you hear about this, in, you know, in history and through my parents, you say a doctor in the family and then never you realize really the importance of a doctor in a family, <laughs> especially in times like this. So one that you can just call no matter what time it is and you get some sort of advice. Yeah. Yes. Well, we, I have several cousins who are nurses and they're equally helpful. But that's, so. that's great. And so you um, so for 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 me, it's easy to establish a passion in, in, you know, someone, a doctor, someone like you. Normally, I have guests that, you know, sometimes we go through different career paths and, you know, you struggle to get to that passion. So I take it when you're a doctor, it has to be vocation because otherwise you wouldn't make it through medical school, I think, if this wasn't something you really enjoyed. You know, I, I think that's true. Although, you know, there's a lot of areas of medicine that are very different. And I think it does take some time. And I think it took some time for me to find exactly where my interests fit best and where my passion was. I, I don't think I necessarily found that immediately. Oh, I love to hear more about that. Tell me about what did you feel? Did well, you I ever think, feel? Uh -huh, go ahead. I didn't go to medical school to be an anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think that that's necessarily high on, you know, the list of high school and college students. It's, it's a little bit hidden from public view. But I really fell in love with being in the operating room and immediate sorts of feedback from patients. You know, what I get to do is, you know, I get to you know, anesthetize people, wake them up. And everything that I do for them is I get immediate feedback. I don't have to wait for months, you know, to see if their blood <laughs> sugar comes down with the treatment. And, and so I, but I think that's important to know about yourself because different people, you know, some people don't want that immediate feedback or that's not their passion. Their passion is really to follow somebody for months and months and, you know, solve or help solve problems that way. Um, I didn't realize that until I was exposed to it in medical school. So I think you have to be open to things that you weren't expecting in your life and not just reject things that you didn't think about before. And then within anesthesiology, you know, right now I'm in charge of quality and patient safety for my department and for some other departments in our healthcare system. And I really, you know, this is not something that I thought I was going to do you know, even when I was an anesthesiology resident, it was not, you know, I didn't say, oh, I want to be the vice chair of patient safety, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, these things come, some things come to you and, and you discover what your passion is in sometimes in spite of yourself. Oh, I love that. I love that. So I actually was going down a career path of trying to do clinical research while taking care of patients. I work at an academic medical center You know, uh, my dad had surgery and had uh, multiple complications after that surgery, some of which I felt at the time might have been avoided. Mm -hmm. um, and that really caused me to look at what we do, you know, on a daily basis to two patients. You know, sometimes it's incredible that, you know, it's surgery and anesthesiology. Is, it's really a miracle that we can do things to patients that we do and, you know, in the goal of fixing something or curing something. It, it's really the human body is, is amazing that it can tolerate a, an operation of any kind, but there are ways that we can always, we can always do better. Um, you know, and science evolves over time and we know now things that we didn't know 20 years ago. And so we have better ways of taking care of people. And I think it's important to continually incorporate that new knowledge into what you do. And so I think I took my experience with my dad as the family member And as, you know, someone who, who watched a family member, you know, have a successful surgery, but then he actually died from an infection. Mm. Really, it was very, very painful. And it's really only recently that I've come to accept the fact that this has contributed 
directly to why I'm in quality and patient safety. Um, so wow, I took you know, what I was doing at the time. You know, at the time when he passed away, I then had to take care of my mother. As I said, I was an only child and I had three children mm. and my husband's also a physician. It was, it was quite a busy time. So I, I made a decision to pivot away from clinical research, which was very difficult to do with that whole setting. Mm -hmm. And in my, I had some administrative duties and I really sort of started to focus on for whatever I was doing that day, making sure that the quality consciously making sure that the quality was excellent. Mm -hmm. You know, as, I think we do it unconsciously as physicians, you know, we're always trained in quality and to do things the best we can do. But I think I became more intentional about it and noticing things. Well, you know, why do we do that a certain way? Why wouldn't, you know, wait, B, be better. And, and so looking back on it, I didn't even realize at the time I was doing that. It's only with a lot of reflection that I, I realized that that really did change how I saw everything about medicine. Wow, that's that's very I mean, you, you said so many things there that are so powerful. And I thank you for that, because, I, you know, I, I can tell you're speaking from the heart and of painful experiences. I can only imagine being a doctor and seeing your father in that circumstance and not being able to help as much as you would like. Yes. And uh, but then the great wisdom in taking that experience and now acknowledging that it happened and, and you made something out of it that it's very powerful. And, uh, yes. you know, I, I, I mean, I can speak for everybody, but anesthesiologist is, is almost like one of the most important jobs because as a patient that has been on that circumstance, you, you're the last person you see. Yes. Almost that usually you talk to, to, to us, you talk to the patient, you put them at ease and just that warmth that you're showcasing. It's, it's really, I'm sure why, why you make the difference in the world you do in the work you do, because you know, you, you, there's a human quality, I think that doctors cannot afford to lose no matter in what category of, you know, medicine you are exercising, but it, it's something that, and I, and I understand why sometimes it's lost because also it's a very demanding, very difficult to deal with patients every day and, and problems, but that humanity, it's so important. It, it is. I think, I think it can take, especially, you know, recently in the past year, I think people understand more now that it can take a big toll on us. You know, I, I do mostly neuroanesthesiology and I have a lot of healthy patients who have spine trouble that will be cured with their operation. But I also have a lot of patients who have brain tumors that are very difficult to cure. And it's a, it is very difficult when you're in an operating room and the pathology report comes back. You know, the patient's still asleep and it's not good news. And the whole room just gets deflated. Everybody. The surgeon, the nurses, even if even if we all thought it was not going to be good news going in, you always want to give that patient hope that, you know, the scan, the scan looks one way, but it, it will be not that bad. Yes. You know, you always want to hold out that hope. And then, you know, when that hope is kind of taken away, it's it's I, I don't think people realize the impact that it has on physicians and nurses and everybody else. And I think that sometimes in order to protect themselves, physicians, uh, you know, put up a wall at times where they seem cold because it that's just emotionally very difficult to do that day in and day out. I, I totally understand it. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's a vocation that, that, that you have to deal with so many aspects, not only the aspect that you're in a, sur in, in a surgery and you already know that this is going to be, you know, a very hard problem to solve or almost impossible, but you still have to give your hundred percent. Yes. Uh, or 150 percent because you want that to happen. You know, as a as, as quick side story, my, my parents were once in a very, very bad car accident and oh. uh, 13 cars in Sicily. They're Italian. So they were for a wedding and there was a tunnel, 13 cars. Well, long story short, my dad had internal bleeding, but uh, he when he got to the hospital, they didn't realize. So they checked him out and then, you know, he have had to be rushed back in. And uh, he was in the hospital for two months trying to uh, assess what was wrong. But uh, again, long story short, he had to have his emergency surgery at a 4 a.m. in the morning 
They changed hospitals. And then the one thing that stuck with him, he said, once I got into surgery, there's this doctor that had been called at 4 a.m. in the morning. And as, as soon as he saw my dad, they say, well, you're bringing me dead bodies. And then my dad, my dad said, doctor, if you want, I want. And those were the, the you know, if you want to do this, I want to do this. And uh, thank God he survived and he recovered. But, you know, my dad said, I don't know if I had been already asleep, probably I would have died because it was me telling the doctor, I'm here if you're here for me and doing this, you know, <laughs> and uh, and it's just such a life-changing experience that I imagine that a doctor is woken up at 4 a.m. in the morning and gets a patient that doesn't look good at all. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, that's uh, something that stopped. My dad is now 86, but he always tells that story that, you know, I, I, I gave that doctor an extra push <laughs> for me. Uh, yeah, that's that's important. I think I think that we, um, you know, I think that what we say is extremely important and we don't always say the right thing. It's it's very difficult to to make that connection sometimes, you know, and in an emergency situation, you have even less time than usual, yes. you know, to try to establish a relationship with a patient. You have two seconds instead of, you know, what I normally have is I say I have five minutes yeah. of, of time, you know, yeah. so it's, yeah, not, no. it's not easy, but I'm glad he spoke up because yes. that does change everything in the room. It, it really does. It makes the person who, who comes in sometimes after a trauma is not conscious and it's very stressful for all of us. And it is a little bit easier to put up a wall, you know, and, and not necessarily absorb the humanity of the person that's there and just think about the problem. Yeah, I love I love that absorbing the humanity. So that, you know, it, it's very inspiring to know that now you champion this patient safety and quality improvement where you focus, as you said, how you started into it. So I definitely want to hear more about that. Like, I'm sure you made this a kind of a, a mission, especially in pandemic times. So what can you share there in terms of what you do and what, you know, your, your institution is doing to improve that quality for patients? Well, I think um, it all starts actually with reviewing events. Mm -hmm. So an event might be something that is, everything was done totally perfectly well, but the outcome is not what we wish. And then sometimes, I mean, people do make mistakes. You know, we, in 2019, our institution did 77,000 anesthetics. So you can imagine with all of that, there, there are some things that could have been done better. And the vast majority of those, there's no harm whatsoever to the patient. But we notice, you know, the medication, we give the antibiotics too early, we gave them too late. We were distracted by something, a piece of equipment stopped working. You know, there's a lot of things that go into a safety check and that happen. And we review every single one of those events, whether it be a major, major event or a little event, even so much that, you know, sometimes a patient will say, I had terrible bruising from my intravenous. And, you know, if, if it raises, if the level of concern is raised or the patient actually comments on it, we will take a look at it because maybe something could have been done differently. You know, that, that's not necessarily a great example, but, you know, everything that happens, we take a look at from, you know, sometimes when somebody has a breathing tube placed, a, ch a tooth will get chipped, even those. And that's, you know, very important for the patient. But in the scheme of major complications for us, that is something that sometimes happens. And so we address it. We make sure that the right equipment was used, that the person was trained properly um, before they did that procedure, that the environment in the room was correct, that everything was clean. You know, there's a lot of checks that go into things before a procedure. And so, you know, there are checklists. I'm sure you've heard about checklists. Yeah. That was really championed by an anesthesiologist at Johns Hopkins and the World Health Organization for certain procedures to have a checklist to make sure you have everything ready before you start. Um, and also, I think the, you know, Miracle on the Hudson story mm -hmm. with uh, Captain Sullenberger, you know, he's in the middle of a crisis and he actually pulls out a paper checklist. Mm -hmm. You know, in spite of his years of flying, he went back to rely on the checklist. You know, let's make sure because when you're in a crisis, you can't forget a step. Mm -hmm. And so we actually have, in spite of all our computer, you know, everything's on computer now. 
Mm-hmm. But in spite of all that, we still have a paper emergency manual in every operating room, mm-hmm. even though, you know, we have it on the computer. And, you know, sometimes the computer will make suggestions to you. Mm-hmm. Um, we still have that. So I really think it all comes from reviewing events and my colleagues' suggestions. Uh, you know, a lot of our faculty has trained, I've been here forever, but has trained at other places where they do things slightly differently. And so they will come to me with a suggestion, say, hey, where I did my residency, we handled warming a patient before the operating room so they don't get too cold. We handled it with such and such a device. You don't seem to have that here. Why not? And so we share all these ideas about what is called, we refer to it as best practices. Mm -hmm. So we, we share that in our department. Uh, we share that with other departments, these ideas, especially with sur- you know surgical departments, because you know they really bring the patients to the op- to the hospital, and they have the first contact with them. And we also share it within institutions. So um, one of the organizations I work with is the New York State Society of Anesthesiologists and the American Society of Anesthesiologists. And you know those of us interested in quality and patient safety serve on committees, and we share best ideas from across the country. And that was really, really evident when COVID first hit the United States. I mean, we formed all sorts of, you know, video messaging and uh, email groups. And we had meetings, virtual meetings and calls at least weekly. What are you doing at your hospital? What are you trying with these patients? What are you doing to place breathing tubes? How are you protecting yourself? Where are you getting PPE? How are you making your operating room an ICU? How are you making your uh, recovery room an ICU? Um, how are you doing anything normal? Uh, yeah, are you no. doing anything normal um, that you usually do? So I think that you know we had departmental almost daily meetings and then video meetings and then you know in, you know statewide it was weekly and we had open forums on the internet that people would post questions. And share ideas. And I have to say, really brought out the best in physicians. People who didn't normally work together, work together. You know, both surgeons and anesthesiologists all became ICU doctors. And, you know, nurses worked outside of their normal way of working. You know, nurses who were not ICU nurses became ICU nurses. And, you know, we, we, we did the best we could. It was overwhelming. I believe it. I believe it. And I think that's one of the things that it became clear to, to, I mean, I, I see it as a patient, as a citizen is the amount of, of commitment that our healthcare professionals had during this time and still have, you know, the, where, where the stories were just unbelievable in time, in terms of the sacrifices, you know, so around the clock shifts, you know, putting their own health at risk. It's just really, as with any challenging experience, it forces you to rise to the top and become better. And hopefully, you know, we, we, keep tapping into that, that we just learn and we're still learning through the pandemic and, and, you know, being able to transfer it going forward into, yes. into, you know, the new normal as we are calling it. I think one of the silver linings is that, you know, sometimes there can be some conflict between different medical specialties. You know, I, we want a medical evaluation before the patient comes to the operating room. The department of medicine says they don't need an evaluation they might not really understand our concerns and vice versa. That is much improved now because we know each other. You know, there there were silos that were definitely broken down by people working together because they were forced to, as opposed Mm -hmm. to, you know, they would never work together other, you know, usually. So I think that, that we have definitely developed better relationships with other specialties that we don't normally work with. And um, that, just serves to improve patient safety. You now have more people you could pick up the phone. And, you know, if I'm worried about something, in, instead of saying, oh, no, no, you don't have to worry about that, the question is now, well, why are you worried? And what can I do to, you know, give you more information? It's a very different conversation now. Yeah, and I agree. And I, I, I sometimes call it like the COVID response in a way, you know, like when you, what, anything you do right now, it's so much more efficient because there's concern of I cannot have people in the same room or, you know, and 
and you try to avoid, and even at school, things the kids do, it's almost like streamlined, right? And so I say, no, I, don't, I, I don't know if it's more streamlined. Well, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Water, certain, but true, I, true. Is that the consciousness is there, that we're all working together and that, you know, we have to collaborate and cooperate rather than, you know, stick to our protocol. Absolutely. And I'm in telecommunication. So I've seen, you know, we know that there's technology out there that has been available for, you know, years. So I wrote a blog recently on telemedicine and saying this technology was there. This is something that we could have done years earlier, but there was no compelling event for us to adopt it until COVID arrived. And now there's a big compelling event and say, okay, if you can see a patient you know, this way on a Zoom call. Now you're in a way kind of streamlining this in person or, you know, you're doing things differently. And uh, and this was for uh, available to us. Yes. Even, you know, I, I'm I'm religious, so I watch the mass. And, and I know that uh, a lot of people were complaining and priests, oh, people are not coming to church anymore. But recent recent statistics show that there's even sometimes more people like watching the mass because now they don't leave their house. <laughs> right. And so now it's like, okay, do I want them to come here, but I have less people or I much rather have people watching wherever they are, but they're watching. And so I think we're having to face all these kind of <laughs> changes and we don't know how to deal with it yet, but not all is bad. Well, you know, what, one of the things is I think that this, uh, you know, video or telemedicine, whatever you want to call it, you know, the focus going forward is really should be, I think, about the convenience of the patient. Mm -hmm. You know, how much effort did we put into putting the elderly into ambulettes and getting them to the office um, for something that maybe they didn't need a full physical exam for? I think, I, I don't think it can, you know, it can't replace a physical exam. You know, there's some things that technology can you know, you could put an electronic stethoscope and listen to the heart. You can listen to the lungs if the patient can put, you know, the device on themselves properly. You know, you see that the, the ads for the electrocardiogram on your phone. Um, all those things are fantastic. But I, I, I think that a lot of follow-up patient visits um, and certainly a lot of pre-anesthesia visits can certainly be done via telemedicine. And the patient doesn't have to come in. What an effort we spent to get lots of patients to come in, family members taking days off from work. They have to drive. They have to get an ambulance. Got to get a wheelchair. It's just a, a lot of a lot of non-patient centeredness happened to get the patient in. Mm, I so I think that that I, I think that I truly believe that that's going to stay with us moving forward. We just have to get sometimes, especially the elderly, are not great with technology. So yes, yes, we yes, need yes. help with that. We need yes. to simplify some of that. Yeah, my industry, it's obviously we're big on the digital divide and the homework gap and everything that, you know, because it's it's true. You also can discriminate with technology if you don't make it readily available for everybody. And that's something, in, at least in the telecom industry, that we are very aware of. And we have yes. to find a way, you know, you have to give options. You know, sometimes I get upset when I go to park my car and now the only option is the the pay by phone app in uh -huh. some places, you know, you have to make it available for someone that is not technology savvy or uh, the elderly right. that not, don't have the app. So we cannot completely forget about that. But uh, the exciting part is that having leaders like you, you know, in, in the medical field that are, you know, so patient centric, I think is one of the key words that I heard you say. And it's in that, you know, shows that we're definitely moving in the right direction. No, I think so. I think uh, uh, that is really what it's all about. And I tell the, the residents every day, you know, I, I'm very lucky. I get to take care of one patient at a time, usually. Um, you know, a lot of other physicians have multiple patients at the same time. And that's difficult. But I mean, you just need to focus on doing the best you can. And I, I tell the people that I'm training, you know, you need to, to treat this patient like your parent or like your child. And I think when you do that, if you just make that your practice and you keep reinforcing that, then the patient care gets much better because it makes everybody pause and say, okay, is this something that I would be doing if this were my family member? Mm -hmm. And if you can say yes, then you're doing the best you can. And that's you know really all we can hope for. You got to pay attention and treat everybody as if they were your family. And 
that's you know the way I see things. I love that. I love that. So, Patricia, when you're not doing, you know, big stuff <laughs> in the medical field, what are your other passions? Like a, a big a big part of what I'm interested in is how do you nurture yourself when you've had like a tough day and you need to reconnect to to what makes you tick? What what, what do you do? Well, I I have to say that, you know, I'm just really focused on my family. I have three beautiful children. Um, all boys. Oh, wow. <laughs> They're 26, 22, and uh, 15. Okay. <laughs> they have a lot of, um, I've always had a lot of activities mm-hmm. that, you know, because I'm not there during the day, I really try to make an effort to be there in the evening and to do whatever I can do with them or for them on the weekends and the evenings. And so I have to say that I'm a little bit boring in that I don't have a a major outside passion except for um, my children and and whatever they want to do. But um, they're they're all very into sports. So I go to a lot of sporting events, you know, that actually brings me great joy to see them be happy at what they're doing. But it is a lot of time. They are actually quite good athletes. And so they, they train and they go and, you know, play sports all over the place. And that, and that's great. No, I, I think it's, uh, I think that's what probably what makes you connect is seeing your kids happy. It's a, that's the same answer my mom would give it. And, and, yeah. and, you know, I always uh, because I'm big, you know, on diversity and inclusion and yeah. in my industry, we don't have that many women. And so it's always something that, that I bring forward. And I always say, well, I had a, a mom that was a housewife the, her entire life. And I always tried to ask her questions about, don't you wish you had done this? Don't you wish you had done that? And she's just so happy. She say, my biggest achievement is seeing my three kids yeah. being happy and successful. And she really means it. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think we also, as women, sometimes we tie that mentality or that happiness to something like, oh, well, she, she didn't want to do anything else. And what's wrong with her? And I think there's a lot to say in having that figure out the happiness of your kids as one of our main goals in life. I, yeah, it, it is. And I actually have made several choices professionally that have, you know, to facilitate my being home at times that I needed to be. And, you know, part of that whole episode around my dad, you know, it made me change my direction professionally. And if you, you know, were to look at my CV, there is about a 10 year gap there of 2005 to 2015, where you don't really see much. I mean, I was doing things, but it wasn't, you know, to the degree that, you know, one might have thought, you know, in my profession. Mm -hmm. So you you do sometimes have to make choices and it's never the wrong choice. It's whatever is working best for you. I think that's important advice. I think that a lot of women, especially because we are caregivers, this is a fact. I mean, I think Mm -hmm. there's research right now available that says that women have, we have added hours to our day already of a very busy day. We have, I don't know, I saw the report and I I know I feel it. (laughs) I know I, I say I'm part of that result. And um, we have to make big compromises. And, um, but at the same time, once you come to terms with them, uh, like, for instance, I work for the family business and, and I have a great career, but I always, you know, people say, well, if you work for someone else, maybe you'll be higher or you'll be making more money or you'll be, but right. I say, yeah, but I have a flexibility yes. that is priceless. You know, that it's- is very important. It's very important if that's what you need. It's it's worth whatever amount in your paycheck. It it really is to be able to know that you know you are able to do what you need to do outside of work and, and and be available when you need to be. It's it's a priceless thing that yeah. I've always had. And like I said, there were some choices that I made to to ensure that, which may or may not have impacted my career. I, I think you know one of the things that I like to say about my career is that I ended up exactly where I was supposed to be even though I didn't know it at the time. And, um, you know, I'm just thrilled with what I get to do every day, which is not everybody can say that. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just really very blessed. Well, I'm so happy you shared that because I know we have a lot of women in the audience and, and, you know, business women or women with big professions and they, they hesitate taking those 10 years that you share that you took or five years or whatever it is that you need to take because they feel the train is going to leave them behind. And as you say, maybe it does, but 
as long as you end up where you are supposed to end up, then what's the problem, right? You, you start seeing life with different uh, eyes. Yes. Well, I actually, I mean, I just assumed at the time that I was not going to advance professionally that I was going to spend my time taking care of my patients. And I had a couple of administrative responsibilities and that was going to be it. And, you know, I made that decision. And of course, I was a little bit disappointed professionally. But it turns out that I probably am, you know, in a position now that I never would have been had I not taken that break and found this true passion for quality, which, you know, came about sort of backwards in a way. It never would have happened. So you, you never know. And I think you just have to remain open. And if you have to make a choice to interrupt your career or your, not your career necessarily, either your career or your, you know, career ascension in whatever field you're in because of outside forces or choices, I think you can rest easy with that. It is the best decision that you make at that time and you, you take it from there. So, well, that's very powerful advice. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking notes from all this wisdom that, that you're sharing. I, I feel blessed to get to interview these amazing guests, as you can see. So it's been great to have you. I don't want to let you go without giving you the opportunity. Is there anything else that you're excited about in your life? A son getting married, anything, our new oh. project, anything you want to share? You have an open microphone. Uh, I mean, I have so much I'd like to share with you on the other <laughs> hour. No, I, I mean, my children are, are are working. My oldest is working in a field he loves. He's a financial analyst for a great company and just did a great, was contributing to a great deal. My middle son plays lacrosse at the University of Michigan. And, uh, you know, he's hoping for a good season this year. Hopefully they'll play through whatever comes with COVID. And my youngest is a sophomore in high school. and you know, trying to navigate the COVID high school world, which is not easy. And my mm -hmm. husband's a cardiac surgeon. who's actually the best doctor I know wow. um, of any physician I've ever met. He's the smartest. And, uh, you know, he has the same um, passion for quality that I have. And fortunately or unfortunately, we're there to support each other after a long, hard day because we do understand Um, and sometimes we don't talk about anything else. <laughs> that's the downside of it. <laughs> that, that's but, the downside. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm, I'm just very blessed, you know. That's, that's great. great. It's, you know, as you said, it's a, it sounds like family it's, uh, is the most important thing to have. You know, it's, it's just to listen and describe your relationship with your husband, the admiration, which, you know, I could have another episode just on that. But I think the admiration <laughs> of your spouse is such an important thing to have for successful marriages where you admire your, your spouse and just, it just showed right now what you just said that, that admiration. So it's inspiring to me. And, you know, I wish the best for your son sounds like exciting times. And, uh, you know, I, I really help. I want to thank you on behalf of all the patients that you probably have treated that, you know, you guys do amazing work. It's inspiring, admirable. And, uh, and I really, um, I'm a fan already oh, of your work. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Likewise. Thank you. And you have an open invitation any other time at Back to Basics. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. And until the next time. <laughs>